So this is what 900 people looks like. OK, no pressure. Let's start. We are at a tipping point when it comes to waste management. It's a social hazard. We have seen pictures of families, entire families, living on these dump sites worldwide. It's a health hazard. We dump our waste, but it's not just our household waste. It is also poisonous materials like mercury from broken thermometers, lithium, cadmium from industrial waste, all of which are cancerous. And we don't even stop to think about it. It's an environmental hazard, which, by the way, the damage is close to irreversible. And actually, did you know, in 2050, we will have more plastic than fish in the sea. We ourselves have felt the impact this year with the unbearable temperatures, followed by the extreme flooding. It should be enough of a wake-up call that climate change is real, right? So what do we do? We need to create a blueprint for change in waste management, not, not just for Mother Lanka and her people, but for also Mother Earth, you know, this common place that we call home of humanity. So we begin by transforming, transforming our Colombo dump site at Mithotamulla into this environmentally friendly waste management facility. Yes, this. And how do we do so? We do so by embracing what I refer to as the two testaments in waste management. Testament number one, we are the waste generators. And therefore, it is we, not the government, that is responsible for its disposal. Testament number two, waste is not waste, but a resource with value. Usually, this is where people kind of look at me, OK, Chintaka is crazy, waste, value. But did you know that 2.1 billion tons of mixed municipal solid waste is generated every year worldwide. And what's interesting is that waste has 24.5 quadrillion BTU energy. That is enough to power Sri Lanka for 234 years. I'm pretty sure without any of these mysterious blackouts we've been having this year. So, these experiences of mine, which led to the two testaments, are mainly from my experiences as a clinical waste disposal service provider. And one of my clients is actually an 800-bed hospital that used to generate about 800 kilograms per day. Now, this was surprising because, if you think about it, it's the same amount of waste that the National General Hospital used to generate, and that has over 3,000 beds. So, obviously, we had to look into it. And what we found was the hospital was unnecessarily mixing its clinical waste with its general waste and was just unnecessarily infecting the whole waste output of the hospital. Of course, the officials didn't know because prior to our services, dumping was simply done. We are the local authorities and they did not have to pay for it. But when we started our services, 800 kilograms per day became an expensive quantum. And the moment they had to start paying, well, it became a different story. They were compelled to engage in the minimization, segregation. And I'm proud to tell you, two months later, they were able to reduce it from 800 kilograms to 120. That is an 87.5% reduction in two months, which translates to 1.3 million rupees savings every month. Isn't it amazing what happens when value is created? What happens is we lose our sense of entitlement that waste disposal is the duty of the government. And we begin valuing every kilogram leaving our house or institution. We begin to become reluctant to simply trash it. And with that, what happens is you kick off a domino effect, right? Parents, teachers, they start to promote the importance of segregation. That makes it easier for the national awareness campaigns, which in turn makes it easier for the government to actually design and deliver specific solutions, which right now they can't. And that, my friends, is how, like my example with the hospital, you create change from within. Sadly, this is not happening today. 
in many countries, not just Sri Lanka. I mean, in, even in Sri Lanka, we have this proposed plan to move the waste from Colombo to Puttalam by train. A, how are you solving the waste problem? B, why would you invest in something that's only going to be a cost burden? Yours and my money. Why? When, especially when, you can get money, revenue out of it. Yes, there will always be social, political, environmental, financial factors that will be pushing and pressuring. But I truly do believe that the blueprint for change in waste management can be as simple as these two testaments, even when it comes to setting policy and project implementation. How so, you may ask? Let me explain. This is a mixed bag of household waste. It's about five kilograms, and if I were to invite one of you in the audience to come and help me segregate this in five minutes, would it be possible? Yes, of course, thank you. Because segregation is simply separating the waste, but it will take you more than five minutes. We actually did this early in the day backstage, and it took about 15. But like I said before, this is only five kilograms. Imagine trying to do the same for the 500,000 kilograms that is generated in the Gampaha district every day. Now imagine not just the time taken, but the resources and the scale of technology required to do so. It's immense. However, if we were to adopt testament number one, we, the citizens, you and I, we would segregate at our homes. And there would be no need for this mixed bag. In fact, I can get rid of it altogether. Excuse me. And instead, we now have separated streams. Kitchen waste, plastics, glass, paper. But hold on. My speech today is not about the importance of segregation. You know this already. It's on Facebook, it's on TV, it's on newspapers. Instead, I would like to touch upon something that is less highlighted, and that is why, without segregation, a holistic solution is not possible. See, any environmentally friendly technology, apart from a thermal process like incineration, which is simply mass burning, is requires mixed household waste to be sorted. Now, you have sorting technologies, but they are expensive and energy intensive. My calculations show me that it's about 20 to 30 percent of the total project cost, an unnecessary cost if we were to segregate in the first place. Right? So what we need to do is make it essential that we segregate. Because when it's an unnecessary cost that we have to pay for, guess who's paying for that? It's us. Why? Because in many countries, like Singapore or Germany, they allow the way for the technology providers to find these increased capital and operating costs. They allow for gate fees, subsidies, tax incentives, annuities. However, Sri Lanka does not have any such financial mechanism. So what does that mean? That means that the return on investment on any waste-to-energy project in Sri Lanka is purely dependent on energy generation, which, if you take the current existing tariff into account, makes the whole thing unviable. And that, my friends, is the primary reason, actually, let me be bold enough to say, is the only reason why you don't have an operational solution on ground today. So that is why segregation is important to us. That is why segregation becomes essential in finding a long-lasting, viable, and environmentally friendly solution. And what does that mean? That means that the answer to our waste problem begins with ourselves, doing our part at our homes. Because when we do so, we create value. And guess what? That's where testament number two comes into play. Where there is value, there will always be an entrepreneur who will find a way to monetize that value. For example, Nisanga. He can 3D print from recycled material. 
right? And what we need to do is we need to give the recyclers access to this waste. So how do we do so? I mean, on one hand, we have 1,500 metric tons of waste generated in Western province every day. But on the other hand, we have recyclers widely established throughout the country without sufficient material to recycle. Why is there this gap? I mean, we have mountains of waste, right? Literally, plenty of waste. So what the government needs to do, and it's very simple sometimes, they just need to organize themselves and find a way where this waste is brought to the recyclers. And it's very simple. You can sell plastic to the plastic recyclers. You can sell glass to the glass recyclers. Thank you. And even the paper to the paper recyclers. And why not? It's all income. Anyway, I think we have provided waste solutions to pretty much all the waste on stage, except for the kitchen waste, the organic waste, the supposedly trickiest of them all. But obviously, I would not be up here if I didn't have a solution for it, right? So let's take a look at my first and final fun fact for tonight. Did you know that 1,000 kilograms, that is one ton of waste, is approximately 50 liters of oil and about 600 kilograms of fertilizer? No? Yes? Yes? No? In today's retail space, that's about 20,000 rupees in retail value. So of the 1,500 metric tons that is dumped in Colombo, uh, about 60% is organic. So if you were to do the math that you see on your screen right now, that comes up to 6.5 billion, not million, billion rupees every year. So guess what? That smelly, disgusting-looking muck that you chuck from your kitchen? That's black gold. Well, in this case, green gold. But, but remember, like gold, its value is worthless lying on or below the ground. It will only happen, it will only gain its value once properly handled and treated. And that same theory applies to organic waste, which, by the way, can be harnessed through proven industrial solutions like biogas plants, which, if you take a look at your screen, can be environmentally friendly. It's actually an accelerated form of decomposition using microbes to emit methane, which, in other words, is biogas. And that is an absolutely natural process. Every day it happens. Plants die when organisms die, or even when one of you have too much to eat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for a country like Sri Lanka, this should be a welcome solution. It really should be. Why? Because we are at a point where our country needs to diversify from highly polluted sources like diesel or coal when it comes to energy generation. And even when we all know that we are having a significant increase in chronic kidney disease due to the overuse of chemical fertilizer. Ladies and gentlemen, I know I have oversimplified in my speech. I only have 18 minutes, right? So, but what I want you to take home today is that these two testaments are key. They're simple, but they're key. If we are all to aspire to something bigger, something better, and that is a circular economy. And what I mean by a circular economy is one where there is no waste and there is no pollution in both technical and biological nutrients, as opposed to our current linear economy, which is simply take, make, and dispose, completely disregarding the health hazards of our people and the environmental hazards of our planet. They only consider profits. So this is, a, this is a town in Birkenfeld in Germany, and guess what? An industrial plant coexists with the farms and the villagers. Imagine that happening in Sri Lanka. 
What happens here is basically the farms and the families basically give their waste to the waste management facility, which gives the electrical energy to the industrial park. And in return, the thermal energy goes back to the houses for heating or cooling, while the fertilizer goes back to the farms for cultivation. What a concept. Our farmers did that 1,000 years ago. But guess what? The concept works. It's not straightforward, though. You can import a technology from country A or country B, but you cannot import a solution. Why? Because our waste footprint is unique to our own. And that calls on a deeper responsibility for you and I to commit to how we are managing waste on a daily basis. Actually, to paraphrase Aristotle, we are what we repeatedly do. And then the true answer to this waste management solution is not an act, but a habit. Thank you.